Good morning. We are going to stand and open up with Cornerstone. Will you please join me in our call to worship and prayer of the day? And this will be read responsibly. I will read the parts in light, and you will respond with what is in bold. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have established strength. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers... What is, my, what is man that you are mindful of him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. Your glory, Lord, is from everlasting to everlasting. Good and wonderful Father, Lord, we proclaim all together. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. How great is your name, Father, in the earth below and the heavens above. Father, we celebrate this day, this day that you have called us into your house, this day that you have called us your children, this day, Lord, that you have reached out your arms to us. Lord, you have come to gather us close to your own heart. 
Father, as we come here today, we pray, Lord, pour your love out upon us. Pour that love out upon us, Lord. Give us that stillness of spirit that right now, Lord, we can feel you close to us, Lord. Give us that stillness of spirit, that faith in you, Lord, that we can just feel you pouring that affection and that delight that you have in us, Lord, and that we can know ourselves as your children. Father, as we gather here in your house today, Father, give us, give us the words in our lips to praise you the right way. Father, give us that spirit and truth into the depth of our being and our hearts, Father, that we can join all creation in singing your praise, Lord, the moon and the stars that you have set in their course in the heavens, Lord. And yet you have made each one of us too. And as you know each star by name, Lord, you know each one of us by name, and you have counted every single hair of our heads, Lord. We know there's no place we can fall beyond your love and care. There's no place that we can go that your eye does not see us. No place we can go where your hand does not hold us. Father, we praise you today, Lord. We thank you for all of your great blessings. And we come together to sing songs of glory and honor to your name and to your Son, our Savior Christ Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. We are going to continue standing and sing hymn number 142, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Please be seated. Well, good morning. It is great to see all of you here on this, the day that the Lord has made. Let us truly rejoice and be glad in it. And I tell you, I know I wasn't the only one when I got up this morning and walked outside and said, oh, thank you. It feels so good out here for once, just after these stifling, long dog days of summer. It was great to feel that nice, cool fall weather. And then really, when I walk out in, in a day like that after a long summer, I'm like, oh, God really does love us, doesn't he? Oh, man, to give us a day like that. Let us truly rejoice and be glad in it. 
I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad you decided to worship with us here today, whether you're a visitor or a member here. And uh, if you're a visitor, I would like to first greet you and say we're glad you joined us and to welcome. And uh, anything you need to know to follow along with the service is going to be printed right here in your bulletin. That being said, I am going to change the bulletin a little bit for you right now. Um, we do have a, a slight change in program. Uh, our third song, What a Beautiful Name, we're actually going to sing that song last. And instead, we'll be singing How Firm a Foundation as our third one. Don't worry, I will let you know right before we do that so we don't get lost. But just to go ahead and give you a, so you can expect it, that's what we're going to be doing. A little change in the program, but that is it. Everything else you need to know, you can follow along with your bulletin just as it's printed. Um, let me get a few announcements I would like to quickly bring to your attention. Uh, first of all, we're not going to have any youth group tonight. Um, no youth group. Um, it's Labor Day weekend. A lot of you are probably listening to me from the beach or the lake. So uh, we're just going to go and enjoy that long weekend. So no youth group uh, this Sunday. Um, however, this week we are going to be starting our women's small group uh, Bible study. And uh, you got two options to meet. You can meet at 1230 or 7 o'clock. Both of those are Wednesday. So women are meeting Wednesday, 1230, and Nancy Comer's uh, 7 p.m. here at the church. Um, any information, any more information you'd like of that, please contact Liz or Nancy um, for any more details about that or check your connector. And speaking of Nancy, we do have a, uh, just a praise that we want to announce. Uh, Bill and Nancy Comer, they invited into this world, is it number six? Their sixth grandchild. Sixth grandchild, yes, yes, that is good. We always... All raise rejoice. Hayes Matthew Montgomery came in at a whopping nine pounds, three ounces. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's a big child, man. He's a healthy baby. <laughs> Born to Aaron and Matt Montgomery. And we just want to continue to celebrate, lift up our prayers for both mother and child, and just remember when new life comes in that, yes, God does really love us. And I believe that is all the announcements that I have for this morning. So now I would like to invite the children of the church Come forward and join Nell for a moment for children. We got a slack crowd here this morning, don't we? Yes. We got some people taking more than one day off, don't we? Yes. So what have we got going on tomorrow? Labor Day. So what is Labor Day about? Or not working. How about that? Well, yeah, and I'm going to ask you about that in a minute. But it's just a way that we honor the workers in our country and give them a day off of work. And, of course, there will be some that will be working, maybe that don't have families just kind of keep things going. But, um, you know, we're thankful that we have the money that we have. And how do we get that money? By working, right? Yes. For adults. Now, sometimes you might do an extra job at home that's not part of your normal duties and make a little money. Is that true? Well, that's good. No, Asher, you need to work on that, buddy. <laughs> because we don't get paid for everything we do. That's just not the way it works out. And even in, if you were listening a while ago, when we were doing the call to worship and we were reading back what Pastor Rob was telling us, it talked about God working and how he has worked ever since the beginning of time. In Genesis, it tells us that he created a beautiful world. And on the first day of creation, he created day and night. And they were all good. On the second day, he created the sky filled with stars, moon, sun, and they were good. Third day, he created water and land, and they were good. And it goes on and on, and he worked for six days. What happened on the seventh day? Asher? He took a break, absolutely, he did. So 
See, God does all kinds of things, and, you know, we as children and adults have to do our part. Um, what is a job that you do at home that you might get paid for that's not part of what you normally do? Scott? Um, helping clean the house. Clean the house, okay. Asher? You don't have any jobs? Okay, I'm gonna talk with your parents later about that, okay? <laughs> we should all help out. And in the Bible, it tells us that one of our jobs is to do good for others. That is the job we don't get paid for. We shouldn't get paid for because we should all remember that it is our job to do good for everybody. So um, tomorrow, people will be taking the day off and today and yesterday, but that's okay. That is the time of the year that we do this, and it means that summer is coming to an end, and for me, I am eternally grateful because that hot weather has been rough this year. But anyway, just remember that we all have jobs, but God, one of our main jobs is that we be good to everybody and help them out, okay? Who wants to pray us out today? I'm, on, I'm not going to give up on you, Asher. Go on, Scott. Dear God, thank you for giving everybody at least one, two, maybe even three breaks, and thank you for making this big world so everybody can enjoy it. Amen. Good job. Okay, y'all have a good week. Be safe. You know, I never thought to pray for three breaks. That's good. That's good thinking, Scott. I like that. I like the way you think, man. <laughs> well, that's not hard to do, is it, Nell? Come on. <laughs> Friends, the Scripture tells us that if we say hey, we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves. The scripture says that if we say we have no sin, we not only we, do we deceive ourselves, but the truth is not in us, and we even make God to be a liar. But then scripture promises is that we are, if we are honest, if we are truthful, if we come before the Lord and confess our sins, then our God is merciful. Our God is merciful and quick to show us his mercy and to grant us full forgiveness and pardon for all of our transgressions. So friends, let us come together and confess our sins, first in quiet meditation in our hearts and to God alone, and then together as it's printed in the bulletin. Let us pray. And now together, merciful Father, you have told us not to be afraid, to trust in you with all our hearts. And if we but attend to your voice and the promises made to us, we should find comfort and courage of heart. Instead, Lord, we allow fear to take root in our hearts. We look at the enemy before us rather than the glory of the heavens above. We focus upon the storm and not the rock that holds us fast. We allow the anxiety of what if to drown out the sound of you reminding us, I am. Forgive us, God, for our fearful hearts. May we trust in you and face tomorrow with joy and confidence. And where there is fear, grant us the courage to endure, trusting in your love, which reigns above all things. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven.
Thanks be to God. And now we're going to stand and sing together um, hymn number 361, How Firm a Foundation Is It Be in the Back of Your Bulletin. Please be seated. Now the scripture passage that we are going to be looking at today comes from the gospel according to Matthew. This is chapter 16 verses 13 to 20. Now before we read this, let's pause for a moment in prayer. Good and heavenly Father. We thank you for your gifts, Lord, for your guidance, Lord. We thank you for the word that you have given us. Lord, we thank you for the word that is written in all the world around us, Lord, in the earth and the wind and the stars above. We thank you for the word that dwells in our hearts. We thank you for the word spoken and given by your Holy Spirit. And we thank you for this word, Lord, written, recorded, and preserved for us to read, that we might know your good and perfect will. Father, bless us as we approach this word today, Lord. Bless these holy words and this holy reading. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven." Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Back in the uh, 1980s and 90s, a group of scholars got together called themselves the Jesus Seminar. Now, I know some, to some of you, 1980s and 90s is a long, long time away, but let me guarantee you it wasn't, okay? It's only about five years ago. Tops. Ten tops, yeah. But back in the 80s and 90s, this group of scholars called the Jesus Seminar got together, and what they were going to do, they were going to get together, and they were going to figure out who the real Jesus was. They were, gonna, they were on this quest for the historical Jesus. And they were going to cut through the myth. They were going to cut through the legend. They were going to cut through the elaborations and the traditions and all the things that they had believed had added over the time. And they were going to get the real Jesus. All right? No messing around. Okay? No legends. No confabulations or wild stories. We're going to figure out who this real Jesus is. Or so they said. It wasn't long after the Jesus Seminar started publishing some of their, uh, some of their findings, and I use that in a loose term. It wasn't long after that that they came under some heavy criticism. Because what the Jesus Seminar ended up doing was taking a lot of the things out of the Gospels. They took out the miracles. They took out the healings. They took out the walking on the water. They took out the virgin birth. They even took out the resurrection. See, in their minds, what they said, they were going back to the real historical sources. In their minds, they had this idea that, that there was this, this older Jesus, this real Jesus, before they created these stories about him, and they were going to find some gospel that preserved this older tradition without all the miracles. They never found that, by the way. They kind of invented some, some mythical gospel called the Gospel of Q that had none of the miracles in there, but they didn't actually find any historical basis for denying any of the miracles or even the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But they dismissed them all the same. And the reason why they dismissed all those miracles is they said they were just too, um, it's too miraculous. Just too hard to believe. And so the Jesus that the Jesus Seminar came up with is not the Jesus that most of us would recognize today the Jesus they had was a teacher the teacher they saw was a preacher he was a prophet he was a visionary but more than that he was a revolutionary and he was a social justice warrior he was a table turner and a convention defier in fact they found a lot of things they could call Jesus but what they didn't find was the Messiah they didn't find was the Son of God, and what they didn't find was Jesus as the Christ. Now, the Jesus Seminar was not the first group of people to try to find the real Jesus, to try to cut through the myth and legend and find the real historical Jesus. They're not the first, and they're not the last to try to do something like this. But what they were really trying to do was answer a question that Jesus asked his disciples 2,000 years ago. Who do you say that I am? 2,000 years ago he asked that question. I don't think there's ever been a question that has caused so much discussion, so much argument, so much fight, so much wondering for such a long time. 2,000 years ago Jesus threw that bomb out to us and we're still arguing over it. And we're still discussing it. And we're still trying to find the answer to that. Who do you say that I am? This is not just a question for scholars. Not just a question for historians or any analyst of the Bible. It's a, story for, it's a question for us. Who do you say that he is? Who do you say that Jesus is? And this is a right question for us to ask. It's maybe the most important question we can ask, and it's right, because Jesus asked us. He asked his disciples, and he asked us still, every one of you. He still asked, who do you say that I am? Actually, it started with, who do other people say that I am? The whole, the whole conversation began when Jesus and his disciples were on the way to a place called Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asked him, so who do people say that I am? So what's the buzz about me? What have you heard? Anybody have you heard? What are people saying about me? 
And the disciples answered him, well, we've heard some people say Elijah. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Jeremiah or another prophet. Now, I want to point out when they say, some say you were John the Baptist, they don't think that Jesus was reincarnated as John the Baptist or reincarnated as Elijah. They were saying that you're coming in the form of Elijah. You're coming in the form of John the Baptist. You're like John the Baptist. You're like Jeremiah. It's kind of like when we see a good running back and we can say, oh man, he's just like George Rogers. Or he's another George Rogers, you know. Oh man, we could use another George Rogers. <laughs> use one back. No, all right, we're not going to talk about that. But we, not from you, definitely not from you, no. <laughs> But, you know, when we say that, we don't mean that George Rogers has been born again or he's the new Ernest Hemingway. He was Ernest Hemingway born again. He's like him. He's in the fashion of him. So when they said, who do they say that I am? You're Elijah or John the Baptist. You're like this person we came before. You're like one of these prophets. And all of them identified him as one of the prophets. And what they were doing was identifying Jesus in a way that they could already understand. They were putting him and comparing him to something that they had past experience with and something they knew, something that was familiar so they could understand Jesus better in their minds. Okay, we've seen prophets before. We know what prophets do. They've always been active in Israel. They speak to us. They speak the word of God. So we know prophets. And Jesus, he looks just like a prophet. He does miraculous things. He speaks by the authority of God. So yeah, okay, Jesus, you seem like a prophet. And that's a very human thing to do. Try to understand something in terms of what we've experienced before. To identify something new by comparing it to what has come before us. And that's exactly what people were doing with Jesus. I know what a prophet is, and you look kind of like a prophet. So I guess, Jesus, you're a new prophet. The problem was Jesus was not something the world had ever seen before. This Jesus was not someone that could fit into any past category or past understanding because this Jesus was something new, something they had never seen, something they had never experienced. This was the inbreaking of God into the world on a level that the world had never experienced and has not experienced since. So they really couldn't get a handle on who this Jesus was. The real question, though, was for the disciples. Jesus didn't, didn't, really, he didn't really care what other people thought about him. He wanted to know what his disciples thought about him. And that's where the question was leading him. Okay, that's what they say. But who do you say that I am? I want to know what you think. You are my most trusted. You are my inner circle. You are my disciples. Who do you say that I am? We don't know what the other disciples thought. Their answer is not recorded in the Gospels for us. But we do know Peter's the only one that had the right answer. He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter had the answer right. The only one that knew it, Christ, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now the word Christ just means anointed. It's a Hebrew word for anointed. He's saying you are the anointed. Now, if you don't know what anointed means, anointed is if you are blessed, set aside, and empowered for a special purpose, usually a divine purpose. God chooses you, blesses you, sets you aside, and then gives you the power for a special divine purpose. That's what anointing is. In the Middle Ages, they used to anoint kings because they believed they'd been set aside by God. They would empower them to be godly kings. So to be, be anointed, there you are set aside and you're blessed for this divine purpose and then God sprinkles you and anoints you with his divine power to fulfill the task that he's giving you. But when he said, Jesus, you are the Christ, he's not just saying you are a Christ, you are the Christ. You're not just any anointed, you're not just unanointed, you are the anointed one. And then this is the purpose of God that has been laid out before the foundation of the earth. This was not just any purpose. This was just the purpose. The divine plan. That's who Christ was anointed as. The son of the living God. The savior of the world. The most anointed of all the anointed. The anointing to end all other anointings. You are the Messiah. You are the Christ. Now Peter here had just figured out who Jesus was. And this was a big deal. 
Okay, he was, he was the first one. And this was a bigger deal than Peter realized. He didn't know exactly what he had walked into. And Jesus told him, he said, Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. This was only by the Spirit of my Father in heaven. Flesh and blood could not have told you what you just said. And what he meant by that was like the normal process of thinking and evaluating and human reasoning could not have come up with that answer. No matter how smart Peter could or wasn't or how smart we are, he could not have come up with that answer all by himself. He couldn't have thought his way there. He couldn't have reasoned his way there. He couldn't have analyzed his way there. He couldn't have even studied all the scriptures and come up with the answer that Jesus was the Christ. Because Jesus told him, this is not natural origin. What you've just said has supernatural origin, Peter. Only my Father in heaven could have told you that. There's no way you could have gotten that answer by yourself. Only God could have revealed and told you such a profound secret. Because the message for us is we can't know Christ by our own reasoning. We can't figure out who Christ is on our own. That is something that has to be told to us by God. That is something that comes from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that is the problem with the Jesus Seminar or any other, the, the, any other quest for the historical Jesus. Okay, that's all human reasoning, human attempts, human science, human scholarship, trying to figure out what only the Spirit of God can tell us. And if you're trying to figure it out through the methods of flesh and blood, you will never find the Christ. You will find a teacher, you will find a revolutionary, you will find a reformer, but you'll never find Christ. If you use human beings, in fact, you're going to find exactly what you want to find. You're going to find the Jesus that you want to find. You'll be like all those others when Jesus said, who do they say that I am that fit him into categories that they were already familiar with? By our own means and methods, we're just going to fit Jesus into a category that we already understand. But Jesus doesn't fit into any of our categories. He's something new, something that we have never known apart from himself. So we, what we need to remember is that if we insist on trying to know Jesus on, on our terms and our understanding, we're never going to know him for who he is. I want you to remember that, okay? Remember nothing else I say today. If we try to understand Jesus on our terms and our understanding, we will never know him for who he is, and we will never know him as the Christ. And the reason why Peter understood is he was willing to see Jesus on Jesus' terms, not on Peter's. And if you want to understand Christ, you have to understand him on his terms and not yours. What that means is you have to put aside what you think is possible. You have to put aside on your expectations of what you think Jesus is and who you think he ought to be and how you think he should act and how you think he should interact with your life. And especially you need to put aside what you think Jesus already expects of you. How far can we really know him if we've already decided who he is? We've already made up our mind about Jesus. How can we ever know him as the Christ? So who do you say Jesus is? Like I said, it's not a question you can figure out on your own. You see, Peter was willing to put himself aside. He was willing to put his expectation aside, and God showed him exactly who Jesus was, exactly the answer to that question. He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. One word, one name he uttered, Christ. And he unlocked something powerful. He unlocked something powerful, that powerful name, that name of Christ. He just revealed a secret of God, which is why Jesus told him not to tell anything, not to tell anyone. Peter, you don't know what you've just unlocked. That's powerful stuff here. The world is not ready for it yet. Gentlemen, keep this to yourselves for the time being. Because he just uttered a powerful name. That's a powerful name indeed if it's backed by faith. 
the name of Christ. It can't just be said by anyone. It needs to be said in faith. It needs to be believed in faith. And if it is, there is tremendous power in that name. Now, it's not a magic word. Right? You can't just say the word Christ and expect miraculous things to happen. But if you believe in the name of Christ, then you can expect miraculous things to happen. Because this is indeed a powerful name. How powerful is this name, you might ask? This is what Jesus tells Peter when he reveals the name. He says, I tell you, you're Peter, and on this rock I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Friends, that is a powerful name. I mean, it is so powerful, he says, that has the power to found and, and, and establish your faith. That name becomes a rock for us. For when we know that name, when we know Jesus as the Christ, he becomes the rock, and that is the beginning of our faith, to know him as the Christ, as the Savior, as the anointed of God, it becomes the bedrock upon which we build our faith. But it's even more powerful than that. It's, it's, it's not just any rock. It's the rock upon which he builds the church. It is the name of Christ that builds the church. It is the name of Christ that unites us together. Here, here in this building, but also with all believers of all time, of all place. Believers that came before us and believers that will come after us. That's how powerful the name is. It made the church and makes it still. But it's actually even more powerful than that. He said, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. That's how powerful this name is. Is that even the gates of hell cannot conquer this name, nor can it conquer you when you trust in it. The gates of hell cannot prevail against you. Anything the world can do cannot prevail against you. Anything evil can throw against you. Even Satan himself, whatever he throws against you, you can endure and prevail if you trust in this name. That's how powerful it is. But it's even more powerful than that. Jesus says, I will give you the gates of the kingdom of heaven. That's how powerful this name is. It unlocks the gates of heaven. For when we trust and we believe in that name, and we know him as our Christ, as our Savior, as our Messiah, that is, opens eternity to all of us. That's a powerful name. It opens the gates of heaven. But it's even more powerful than that. Jesus says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The name of Christ has the power to bind and has the power to loose. It binds us together as one body. But it can also loose things. It can also give us freedom. The power of freedom and liberation. The name of Christ has the power to give you freedom from sin. It has the power to give you freedom from evil. The name of Christ has the power to free you from bad habits and addiction and depression and lies. The name of Christ has the power to release you from deceit. It can free you from past mistakes. It has the power to free you from fear and even death itself. That is a powerful name. The name of Christ. But it's not the word. The word doesn't do anything. Saying the word, making that noise with your mouth does nothing at all. But believing in the word. Believing in Jesus as the Christ. That can do all things. It's a simple question he has for us. Who do you say that I am? Not just a question for disciples. Disciples. Those original 12 is a question for all believers. Who do you say that Jesus is? Is he just a teacher, a prophet, an exorcist, an, act of, an, an activist? Is he just a really swell guy? The answer is going to depend on you. Do you want the Jesus that you can fit into a box of your understanding? Do you want a Jesus you can tie up really easily so it doesn't mess with your life too much? Or are you ready to know him as he is? Would you prefer to keep Jesus on your terms? Or are you ready to know him on his terms? Do you want him to just stay Jesus to you? 
Or are you ready to know him as the Christ? It may seem like just a name, but there's a power to this name. This is the name that can bind and loose. This is the name that is the everlasting rock. This is the name that can conquer hell. This is the name that unlocks the gates of heaven. It's not a name known by any flesh and blood. But it's a name known to all of those who will listen to the Spirit of God. It is a name known all to those that are ready to open their eyes. Who are ready to open their hearts. It's a name known to every single person who is ready to know Jesus as the Christ. To God be all the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, will you pray with me? Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. Father, we thank you today that you have given us this name above all names. We thank you today, Lord, that you have given us a name upon which we can found our faith. That you have given us a name to, to create and bind your church together. You'll give us a name that conquers hell itself, that opens the gates of heaven. Lord, you have given us a name to bind and loose and to free us from all that burdens, Lord. And Father, today we just want for a moment just to celebrate that name. Just that beautiful name of Jesus, that name of Christ. To celebrate what you have done for us, Lord, and just this amazing gift that you have given us, Lord. And we, and we just thank you. And I pray, Father, for every person here, every single one of us, that we would know your Son, not just as Jesus, but as the Christ. As the Christ of the world, as the Christ of scriptures, and as the Christ of our heart. Christ known to each and every one of us as Lord, known to us as Savior. Father, I pray that you help us to live in that confidence and faith of your Son as our Christ, to not fear what the world does, to not worry anything that this world can throw at us, Lord, but to trust in you and your name. And I pray, Father, that that loosening on us, that freedom from all that binds us, Lord, I pray today, Lord, it's a freedom, from, uh, a freedom from debt, Lord, a freedom from despair, a freedom from depression. Lord, I just pray a freedom for those that hear that voice of doubt in their hearts, Lord, that voice of just constant self-criticism that tells us we're not good enough, that we're not loved, that we're not strong enough, and that you don't really love us, Lord. Just let us free us from that, to know ourselves as your chosen children. To know you as our Christ. And Father, it is in that faith that we lift up this world to you and just pray your blessing, your peace, Lord. We just pray that this name goes out everywhere. And everyone would come and know your son as their Christ. And the world would know your son as Christ. And Father, we pray peace where there is war. We pray love where there is hatred. Father, we pray a fullness where there is poverty, Lord. We pray food where there is hunger and drink where there is thirst. We pray light where there is darkness. And we pray the good shepherd of your son to find those who are lost. Father, help us to be your hands and feet in this world. Help us to be the face of your son, Jesus Christ, to all we meet. Though we are not worthy of such an honor, Lord, help us as we strive to be your good people. Father, in faith, we lift up those who need healing today, Lord. We lift up Bailey and Joe and Missy and Mike and Allison and Peepsy and Joy. We lift up Debbie and Isabel and Karen and pray, Father, just powerful healing upon their lives, upon their bodies and souls. We pray for those who grieve today, Lord. We pray for Jeannie and the Wade family. And there be comfort in their hearts for their loss. Father, we pray for those who need guidance and strength. And in particular, lift up Leah today, Lord. And just pray a mighty anointing of guidance and peace upon her life. And Father, as we 
come and ask for these things. We also remember your great blessings. And Father, we thank you for the gift of new life. We thank you for the new life that has come into the Comer family and pray that you would bless both mother and child. Father, we lift up to you unspoken prayers. And pray, Lord, now in this time that you would hear the silent cries of the people gathered here today. We ask these all in the name of your Son, our Savior, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now at this time, I would like to invite uh, Keith Foster to come up with uh, his guest. Join us here at the baptismal font and also our elder, John Baffert. This is always a joyous occasion when we are able to uh, introduce uh, new members into our congregation. And this is a very familiar face. You've probably seen him a lot. He's been hanging out with us a good bit, and uh, we have really enjoyed having him around. I've been really enjoyed getting to know him. And really, actually, the amazing part is kind of realizing how many people he actually knows in this church. So like every time I mention Keith, oh, yeah, I know him. I know him. We go way back. So I think it kind of makes sense that he's joining us today. And, um, and Keith, we're just so happy that you here are here with us. And man, I feel like maybe the only question I should ask you is, who do you say Jesus is? You know, that's, but, but we'll get to that in a minute. But well, for now, friends, uh, Keith Foster is presented by session to be received as a new member by transfer of letter from Pond Branch United Methodist. We rejoice that you are here with us to share in the work of ministry and the life of worship as we seek to do God's will and to share his love with the whole world. Hear these words from Ephesians. You are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. On behalf of the oh, session of Cherokee Presbyterian... You want to Oh, oops, sorry. On behalf of the session of Cherokee Presbyterian, I present Keith Foster to be received by transfer of letter. Keith, now as you publicly declare your faith, to ask you to reject sin, profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess the faith of the church, holding fast to the hope of Jesus Christ. And now trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn away from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? I will. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation, share in its worship and ministry through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? I will. Do we as members of the Church of Jesus Christ promise to guide and nurture Keith and by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging him to know and follow Christ and to be a faithful member of his church? If so, say we do. Amen. Let us pray. Good and merciful Father, Lord who first opened his arms to us, Father we thank you that you have opened your arms to Keith. And received him, Lord, not, in, not just into this congregation, Lord, but you have received him into the congregation of all the faithful. Father, I pray that your blessing be upon him, Lord. I pray your spirit pour out upon him. Father, I pray that you grant him all the gifts that he needs to be a true and faithful servant. Father, grant him endurance to see this race to the very end. And Father, I pray that that special gift upon him, Lord. I pray that the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit be made manifest in his life. And most of all, Lord, I pray 
Father, that when he meets you one day, that he will hear these words from your son, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, may that same anointing be poured out upon us all as we struggle and as we strive to be your servants. But Father, may Keith and all of us trust in you, knowing that you have never lost one yet, and you won't lose us today. Father, we thank you for all of your good gifts, and we ask these things in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And one more thing. Well, two more things. Uh, you know, one more thing on behalf of Cherokee Church, we present you with a really cool cross. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome. And actually, this is one more thing. This is one. We're going to ask you to sign our book of membership here, as uh, we ask all to do, as your official uh, reception into our church. And I want all of you just to make a point, see him to church, say hello, welcome him into our, into our life and into our congregation. And now let us all stand together with Keith and declare what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed, and you can find those words printed in your bulletin. Friends, what is it you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Welcome, man. Welcome, brother. Yeah. <laughs> we'll take some later. Sometimes I fall to my knees and pray. Come, Jesus, come. Let today be the day. Sometimes I feel like I'm going to pray. I'm holding on to a hope that won't fade. Come, Jesus, come. We've been waiting so long for the day you return to heal every hurt and right every wrong. Come and turn this around. Deep down I know this world isn't home. Come, Jesus, come. Come, Jesus, come. There'll be no war. There'll be When Jesus comes, let today be the day. You'll come for the weak and the strong just the same. And all will believe in the power of his name. For the day you return to heal every hurt and right every wrong, we need you right now. Come and turn this around. And deep down I know this world isn't home. Come, Jesus, come.
stand face to face, lay it all down, because it might be today. Friends, our generous God has given us all good things, even the name that opens the gates of heaven itself. In exchange for all these gifts, God asks us for our love, our faith, and our obedience. And one of the ways we can show that love and obedience is to give back a small portion of the great abundance He has blessed us with so we, so we can support this mission of sharing His name with the whole world. There are many ways that you can give to the work here at Cherokee Presbyterian. We have offering plates on either side of the doors. You leave the sanctuary. You can also give through Venmo, PayPal, ACH Bank Draft, or United States Postal Service. We thank you for all the ways that you support the work and ministry here at Cherokee. And now in awe of response of thanksgiving to all that God has given us, let us stand and sing our thanksgiving response. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you once again for these and all the gifts that you have given us. And Father, I pray that you bless all that we have given here today, Lord, that you would bless both the gift and the giver, and all that we bring to you will be used to proclaim the mighty name of Christ Jesus until every knee bows and every mouth proclaims your Son as Lord. Amen. And now we're going to continue standing. We sing our last hymn and remind you that is back a little bit to what a beautiful name.
Go now as children of God and as the people of Christ, filled with the promise of His name. And now may the blessings of Almighty God and the grace of Jesus Christ be with you everywhere you go. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.